we have in this country a unique and priceless heritage of recorded church music, stretching way back to 1902, from choirs of gentlemen and boys singing in the English cathedral tradition, most of which don't exist anymore. For a country so obsessed with its heritage, this is one part which has been almost completely ignored. In fact, no one really knew what had been recorded by our choirs, as it had never been researched, catalogued or preserved as a unified collection. So, in 2003, I decided to do just that, and now the discography and collection is acknowledged to be the most definitive ever assembled. Eventually, it will be left to an educational establishment as a national resource for listening and study. From this rich choral heritage, we'll journey through the decades, listening to rare and private recordings, matched in date with archive photographs, many of which have been given by the choirs themselves for this presentation. The very first gramophone records went on sale in England in 1897, and were mostly orchestral and brass band music. They were issued by the Gramophone Company, later to be known as His Master's Voice and EMI. These early records, or 78s as they're commonly called, were recorded acoustically, with the sound travelling down a metal horn to a vibrating stylus, which then cut directly into a wax master. No microphones as yet, and the records were thick, heavy, and recorded on one side only. This photo of Sir Edward Elgar conducting his violin concerto illustrates an early acoustic recording. So, in your mind's eye, replace the orchestra with a choir, and there you have it, gathered round a large horn, singing their hearts out. The choir had to travel to the recording studio, as the equipment couldn't be moved. In the opening decade of the 20th century, these five London choirs were the first to produce gramophone records. St Andrew's Well Street in 1902, the London College for Choristers in 1904, Christ Church and Holy Trinity in 1905, and Westminster Cathedral in 1907. Four of the choirs were recorded by the Gramophone Company, which used the trademark known as the Recording Angel. Nipper, the iconic His Master's Voice dog, didn't appear on their record labels until about 1913. The fifth choir was the London College for Choristers, who recorded on the Odeon label, the only company at that time to produce double-sided gramophone records. This was the choir's one and only recording, and a copy has yet to be discovered. And this is where it all began, the choir of St Andrew's Church, Well Street, the very first to make a gramophone record. Considered to be one of the finest choirs in London, St Andrew's had its own residential choir school. Choral matins and evensong were sung daily, with choral Eucharist on Sundays and all major festivals. The choristers were allowed a Monday off. Until recently, it was thought the choir first recorded in 1908, but I have discovered 13 unknown records from October 1902, so some rewriting of history has been necessary. These were all rushed out for a pre-Christmas release, and what you are about to hear, Bethlehem by Miles B. Foster, is one of only three surviving records from the Thirteen. In historical terms, it's one of the jewels in the crown of the collection, and a minor miracle that any copies have survived.
This rare photograph from 1895 shows one of the three classrooms in the newly built choir school for the 24 choristers. It was donated by the granddaughter of Frank Stamper, who joined the choir at the age of eight in 1891, and you can see him on the photo as a 12-year-old. At the age of 21, he became suborganist of St Andrews. The second decade of the 20th century saw two new choirs record, Westminster Abbey, not wanting to be outdone by the cathedral, and the Church of the Immaculate Conception, Farm Street, where the most famous countertenor of his day, Ben Millet, was a member of the choir. Westminster Cathedral continued to record during this decade and was the only other choir to do so, producing a further 15 records. As you can see, only 21 records were issued during this entire decade. The inconvenience of getting a choir to the recording studio and the poor sound quality of the finished result certainly didn't make choirs rush to record. I am now going to play you extracts from two gramophone records issued in 1911. Firstly, from Westminster Cathedral, who already had 16 recordings under their belt, then followed by the first recording from Westminster Abbey, so you can compare the sound of the two choirs. Here is Westminster Cathedral singing Gunod's Sanctus. <laughs> the first recordings from Westminster Abbey, when the crimson sun had set. The 1920s saw the single most important development in the history of the gramophone record. The introduction of electrical recordings using this newfangled device called a microphone. Not only that, but the double-sided record, made of thinner and lighter shellac, had now become the standard format, and the floodgates were opened of choirs eager to record. 
The other revolutionary advantage of the microphone was that recordings were no longer confined to the studio, and HMV lost no time in fitting out its famous mobile recording van, which travelled the length and breadth of the country in search of choirs. No longer did the choir have to come to the studio, the studio came to them. Before the arrival of the microphone in 1925, it was in fact a misnomer to say the choir, as it wasn't possible to capture all the voices in the studio. The last acoustic recording was made in 1924 by St George's Chapel Windsor, a four-record set of matins. Recorded at the Gramophone Company studio in Hayes, Middlesex, the choir consisted of six choristers, one alto, one tenor and one bass. What I'm going to do now is play you an extract from this acoustic recording, followed immediately by the first microphone recording from the Chapel Royal, made in 1926, so you can hear the difference in sound quality. Star 23 
That recording was made on the 20th of March 1926, when HMV's new mobile recording van rolled up to the Chapel Royal for the very first time. This was also the first time microphones had been used to record an entire choir, and by the end of the day, four double-sided gramophone records had been completed. As well as the dramatic improvement in sound quality, two other major differences are apparent. Firstly, the reverberation of the building adds to the overall effect, and secondly, you hear an organ being used for the accompaniment, not a studio harmonium. This splendid photo, showing the children of the chapel, is from the same year as the recording, and was given by the daughter of Frank Dobinson, who you can see on the left of the photograph. A year after the Chapel Royal recording came one of the most famous records of all time. And don't worry, I'm not going to play you Oh for the Wings of a Dove, but I think you'll find this little known fact about the recordings, yes, recordings in the plural, to be of interest. Fifteen-year-old Ernest Lough and the already famous choir of the Temple Church, directed by George Thalbin Ball, recorded Hear My Prayer on the 5th of April 1927, with Ernest standing on a pile of books as he couldn't reach the microphone. The HMV sound engineers had by now honed their skills to a fine art, and even by today's standards, the sound quality was a triumph. During the first eight months, not far short of half a million records were sold, and six presses worked day and night at the HMV factory to keep up with demand. By the end of the year, the metal stampers which pressed the records had worn out, much to the horror of HMV, as this was their biggest money maker. So they decided, in secret, that a new recording would have to be made, and this took place on March the 30th, 1928, Ernest now being 16 years old. There are some considerable differences between the two recordings which HMV hoped no one would notice, and no one seemed to at the time. The original recording is actually 16 seconds longer, but the most noticeable difference is in the opening bars, where Ernest aspirates the hear of Hear My Prayer. In the second recording he doesn't, it's much smoother, yet Ernest himself preferred the original recording, describing his voice as crisper. In the next slide, you will firstly hear the opening of the original recording with the aspirated H's, and in the second recording a year later, you will hear it's much smoother. Despite the record's iconic status and estimated sales to the present day of over six million, neither Ernest Lough nor the Temple Church Choir received a single penny in royalties. Three unusual and very different choir schools were to make their recording debut during the 1930s. The most quirky was undoubtedly St Mary of the Angels Song School, founded by the Reverend Desmond Morse Boycott. Another was the London Choir School, and the third was St Nicholas College Chislehurst, founded by Sir Sidney Nicholson.
Amongst the many choir schools in London, there were two which are now almost forgotten, yet in their heyday were of immense importance. If you recall, I've mentioned the London College for Choristers, 1894 to 1940, and their one and only recording on the Odeon label. The other was the London Choir School, from 1915 until 1958. The purpose of both these choir schools, which were day and boarding, was primarily to supply the London churches and chapels with choristers, either on permanent contract or as and when required. Between them, the two schools supplied over 150 establishments. The choristers of the London Choir School broadcast a Christmas service in 1938 which was simultaneously recorded by the BBC onto a set of eight records. Seven of the records are lost, and only one copy of the eight survives in the National Sound Archives. This is the only known recording of the London Choir School, and the BBC authorised a copy to be made for my collection and this lecture. So, from this unique recording, here are the choristers of the London Choir School singing The First Noel. When Sir Sidney Nicholson founded the School of English Church Music in 1930, which later became the Royal School of Church Music, he realised the huge potential of the gramophone as a teaching aid, writing extensively about its benefits in choir training. So, to this end, his choir at St Nicholas College produced over 20 records to demonstrate the proper singing of the services, responses, hymns, canticles and psalms. The chorister's parents paid the princely sum of ten guineas per term for board, lodgings and education at the college, including either a choice of piano or violin lessons. Money well spent when you hear this wonderful rendition of Handel's O Lovely Peace, recorded by the ten choristers in 1939.
By September of the same year, war had been declared, the college closed, and these choristers evacuated to other choir schools. The war and its aftermath had a devastating effect on the number of gramophone records. From 138 in the previous decade, now down to only 31. Choral services in London churches and cathedrals were severely disrupted, as most of the choristers were evacuated and in cathedral schools throughout the country, air raid provisions had to be made for their safety. The choristers of Durham Cathedral had their dormitory moved to the medieval crypt chapel under the deanery, and had a whale of a time exploring secret passages and staircases. In 1941, the choir of Westminster Abbey was temporarily disbanded, and the boys evacuated to other choir schools. New College took five of the choristers, the other ones in the darker suits, but their style of singing was not to Dr Andrew's liking, complaining they had been supplied without a volume knob. But he grudgingly acknowledged they were an invaluable addition in those dark days. The photograph was taken in the summer of 1941 by Dr Andrews himself, a keen amateur photographer, and these are the very choristers we're about to hear. By the way, the boy with the arrow above his head is Richard Greening, later to become director of music at Litchfield Cathedral. Whilst a chorister at New College, he did a Mozart and copied out a score of Allegri's Miserere from memory, note perfect. So, why New College? Well, it's because they were very much the public voice of English cathedral music during those dark years. Broadcasting over 60 BBC Choral Eden songs, from the summer of 1940 until the end of the war. Thank you. 
1949, Columbia Records embarked on an ambitious project, their famous anthology of English church music. The series was compiled and edited by the Rev. Dr. E. H. Fellows, and several of the most respected choirs of the day performed music from the 15th to the 20th century. Between 1949 and 1954, a total of 48 records were issued with accompanying booklets. This was to be the flagship of Columbia Records. Unfortunately, the timing could not have been worse. Columbia chose to record a series on 78s, yet by the time the series was complete, the 78 record had almost been superseded by the LP. All the more ironic, as it was Columbia Records who invented the LP. To add to their woes, the reviews ranged from the lukewarm to the scathing, and Dennis Stevens in particular dripped vitriol from his pen when he said of the St Paul's performance of The Wilderness, The closing bars are a splendid apotheosis of the mawkish and the maudlin, and the small solo boy who sounds as if he is genuinely in pain has my sincere sympathy. But today, these 48 records are an important and invaluable historical archive. Before we move on, I am sure you are anxious to hear just how pained the small solo boy was. Well, judge for yourself. Our century of recorded church music divides neatly into two halves. For the first 50 years or so, the 78 gramophone record reigned supreme, and for the next 50, it was to be the LP followed by the CD. From 1902 until 1957, I have so far catalogued over 80 choirs who issued between them almost 600 gramophone records on commercial and private labels. Nor does this take into account a hundred or so records from solo choristers singing without their choir. Whilst researching 78s, I was surprised by just how many small private labels were issuing recordings. So far, I have tracked down 23 of them, and they continue to turn up quite regularly. On average, about 50 copies of a private record would be pressed, but sometimes as few as two or three which makes it all the more remarkable they have survived. When a choir or a solo chorister went to this much trouble to make a recording, it's a pretty fair bet they were good, and in many cases, outstandingly good. As we're about to hear on this privately pressed 78 record, by the Royal Wanstead School Chapel Choir, with their two head choristers singing Mendelssohn's I Waited for the Lord.
that was just one example of the many superb choirs we wouldn't be able to hear today if it weren't for those privately pressed 78s. And now we really do bring to a close the first part of our story, when HMV issued the last 78 RPM gramophone record in 1957. This was the culmination of an amazing recorded legacy which has been left to us on those also breakable 78s, and one which still remains relatively unknown to musicians and music lovers alike. The last 78 record was a Salisbury Cathedral choir singing Edmund Rubra's Sanctus and Agnes Day, with the recording being supervised by the composer himself. This photo of Edmund Rubra posing with the choir in front of the HMV mobile recording van is missing one of the choristers, and I wonder if you can guess where he is. Well, he's standing in front of them, with his box brownie camera taking the photo. Little did he think that years later it would become a historical treasure. Columbia Records introduced the first LP in 1948, which was to revolutionise the entire recording industry. And it was also on the Columbia label that the first English choir LP was issued by St Paul's Cathedral in 1954. When you think that the maximum playing time of a 78 record was 9 minutes and an LP was 50 minutes, the amount of church music that was to be recorded during the LP era was simply mind-boggling. The choir of St Paul's Cathedral had embarked on their first foreign tour in 1953, singing in the major cities of Canada and the USA. So to commemorate this historic event, two LPs were issued simultaneously the following year. In Canada and the USA, they had the delights of a boxed set, with a lavishly illustrated booklet depicting the life of a St Paul's chorister. In England, it was two separate LPs, with a not so lavish booklet. And from one of these LPs, here is Wilkes, Hosanna to the Son of David.
1960s was the decade of the LP explosion, when the recordings of choirs really started with a vengeance. On the top row, you see the major international labels of EMI, Argo and Decca, who produced some of the greatest choir recordings of all time. And on the bottom row, the first three independent labels specialising in church music, Abbey, founded in 1962, Cathedral and Guild in 1967. Yet our next two choirs aren't taken from LPs, but from privately recorded reel-to-reel -reel tapes. The Peterborough sound under Stanley Van was unmistakable and justly famous, yet only six commercial LPs were issued during his time there. So the donation, by his son Martin, of over 60 private recordings of the choir is one of major historical and musical importance. And from one of these private tapes, we hear a composition by Stanley Van himself. Behold how good and joyful a thing it is. Shortly before Stanley Van's death, he listened to this recording and instantly recognised the voice of his head chorister at the time. That's Keith Gibbs, he said, more vibrato than most trebles, but not too much. Founded in 1848, All Saints Margaret Street was one of the most famous choirs in England, complete with its own residential choir school. They were the last word in high church worship, the ultimate Tractarian dream, even down to the robes of the choristers, complete with socks the colour of their cassocks and black buckled shoes. The choristers were often used in recordings with various adult choirs, but the actual choir of All Saints made even less commercial recordings than Peterborough did, three to be precise. So you can imagine the excitement when this private reel-to-reel -reel tape turned up, literally from the proverbial attic. The recording is of a complete concert given by the choristers in Birmingham in 1966, and from that we shall hear Mozart's Laudate Dominum.
Two years after this concert, the school was closed and this magnificent choir disbanded. The two private recordings we have just heard are from the many hundreds in the collection. These were made either by choir directors or enthusiastic amateurs, armed with domestic or semi-professional recording equipment, and usually represent the only copy of that recording. We owe them an immense debt of gratitude, for without their dedication we would have very few recordings of some choirs and absolutely no recordings of others. The first broadcast of BBC Cordelim's song was from Westminster Abbey in 1926 and continues to the present day. And, as we have heard, not even a world war could stop them. So you might think that the BBC tapes of these broadcasts would be a great treasure house of recorded church music. Sadly not. In one of their infamous purges, all tapes from before the early 80s were wiped in an unprecedented act of cultural vandalism. So far, I have gathered up nearly a thousand broadcasts, with the earliest being from 1948. I am sure you will recognise the cathedral on the screen as Durham, and as to Durham we are about to travel. But Durham from an earlier time, when Conrad Eden reigned supreme for 39 years. Yet, in all that time, the choir produced only one seven-inch record containing four short anthems, a testament to his intense dislike of recording. This makes the recently acquired tapes of six BBC Choral Evensong broadcasts by Eden's choir to be of immense historical importance. It's often said that choristers mimic the voice of their choir master when singing, either unintentionally or otherwise, and this was never more so than at Durham, where the boys sang with Eden's characteristic emphases, inflections and clipped vowels, particularly in the Psalms. So, from a 1960 broadcast, here is Durham singing part of Psalm 106.
photo from the Daily Mirror archives is the choir singing on top of the cathedral tower and was taken two years before the recording you've just heard. The 1970s saw the arrival of eight more independent labels, all dedicated to church music. Not only that, there were many, many smaller labels, often just a one-man band, busily pressing and recording LPs, all of which meant it was quite a simple matter for a choir to produce a record. The hallmark of this decade is the sheer diversity of choirs. School chapel choirs, church choirs, independent choirs, smaller cathedral and choral foundation choirs, they all wanted to produce an LP. As to the finished product, the singing ranged from the really dire to the simply sublime. Another feature of the 70s was the resurgence of the solo treble recording, pioneered by the Abbey label. As well as BBC Choral Evensong broadcasts, another rich but neglected source of recordings are the radio and television broadcasts of services, concerts and recitals, together with the many fascinating documentaries on choirs and church music which have been produced over the years. Many hundreds of these are now in the collection, with the earliest radio broadcast from 1939 and from television, 1954. I could give so many examples of their importance, but time permits only one. Langdon Colborne was organist and master of the choristers at Beverley Minster for only a year in 1874, and during that time composed the anthem, Ponder My Words, O Lord, especially for the choir. Alan Spedding specifically recorded this anthem for a radio broadcast in the series called English Cathedrals and Their Music, which was introduced by Ivor Keyes in 1979, and if he had not done so, there would be no recording of this little Victorian gem. By the mid-1980s, the CD was now established, and the writing was on the wall for the LP. 
but in the world of recorded church music, life moves at a more sedate pace. There were 370 choir LPs released during this decade, compared to only 63 CDs, and it wasn't until 1989 that the LP was finally phased out, although existing stocks continued to sell for many years after. Also, just look at the amount of specialist church music labels which were founded this decade, and apart from three, are still going strong today. Nor does this take into account the many small private labels, some of which even worked from home. It's no exaggeration to say that without these specialist labels, we would have almost no recordings of church, school chapel, minor cathedral and choral foundation choirs. One of these home-based private labels was called Dog Rose Studios, owned by a temporary old boy, and probably represents a supreme example of their importance, as he recorded for posterity the final three services of St Michael's College before his closure in 1985. Not many choirs can be called legendary and unique, yet St Michael's was both. Founded by the Reverend Sir Frederick Arthur Gore Oosley in 1856 as a model choir school, it holds a very special place in the history of English church music. The final even song was on the 13th of July 1985, and from that service here is Stanford's Magnificat in G, the treble soloist being Tobias Edwards, head chorister. <laughs>
a truly heartfelt performance. You can sense the emotion of the choristers who were to be bussed off to their various new choir schools the following day. The final decade of the 20th century was truly a golden age of recordings, with more being issued than in any previous decade, 575 in total. Although we are spoilt for choice musically, there was nothing historically significant about this decade, except perhaps for one very special BBC choral song. Sung by the choristers of Bramdean School Chapel Choir, the BBC received more telephone calls and letters of praise than for any other choral song broadcast to this day. So here is the sound which caused the BBC switchboards to work overtime. School chapel choirs are one of the forgotten glories of English church music, and I could give an entire lecture on them alone. We are so fortunate, and the envy of choral music lovers the world over, to have so many record labels still committed to the recording of church music. So, as our journey comes to an end, let's celebrate this very English affair with a recording from one of these English labels sung by one of the oldest of English choirs, in a work by one of the greatest English composers. The label is Herald. The choir is Winchester College Chapel, where the choristers have been singing the treble line for over 600 years, and the composer is Benjamin Britten, in a performance of a work that couldn't be more appropriate to sum up a century of recorded church music, his tedium in C, we praise thee, O God.
Thank you so much for listening, and I do hope you have enjoyed your journey through a century of recorded church music. And I leave it to the Backhouse Brothers of York Minster to have the final say. <laughs>